Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Smart Electricals, Mike speaking. How may I help you today? Ah, oh, good morning. I'm calling to complain about an item I recently purchased from your company. I'm not happy with it. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I'll take you through the company's complaints procedure. I'll need to retrieve your files from our records so that we can discuss the problem properly and find a solution. I'll need to take some details from you first. Is that okay? Okay, but I don't have a lot of time. Will it take long? Not long, madam. Can I first take your name? Yes, it's Susan York. Y O R K E. Okay. Can I have the address, please? Yes, it's flat one, twenty-five Alpine Avenue. That's A L P I N E Avenue, Harchester. The postcode is H A six five L D. Okay. Next, could you give me your telephone number, preferably one that we can call you on during normal working hours? Well, the home one is o one seven three four five two five two six eight, but you're only likely to catch me on that number in the evenings. I usually have my mobile phone with me during the day, though. It's probably best to take that number then. All right. My mobile number is o seven eight one two double three four five two. And do you have the order reference number on you by any chance? Well, I have the receipt that the camera came with in front of me. Ah, good. Which number is it? It's a bit confusing. It should be the seven-digit number on the top left corner of your invoice. Let me have a look. I need my glasses. Found it. It's D M X eight double four three. Thanks. Now, when did you purchase the item? Well, the camera was delivered last Monday, on the first of February. I ordered it online about two weeks before that, but I can't remember the exact date. If you have another look on the invoice receipt, the date should be there. Oh yes, here it is, January the fifteenth. Okay, I'll make a note of that. So the item is a digital camera. Yes, it's the Aqua PowerShot model in silver. Thank you. Did you take out any kind of insurance when you bought it? Well, no. It was on special offer. I didn't need to pay any extra for the insurance because it came with a special four-star policy. Well, it means you're fully covered for at least another three years. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Right. What is the problem? Yes, the first thing is that it came with one memory card in the box when there were supposed to be two. Oh dear, I'm terribly sorry about that. It must have been an oversight in the packing department. I can do something about that straight away and get one sent out to you. Well, that's not the only thing. I bought it as a present for my niece because she loves swimming. It said on the website that it was waterproof, but when she took it on holiday and tried to use it under water, it got ruined because water got into the lens. You can imagine how disappointed my niece was. I certainly can. Were those the only problems? No, there was one other thing. It came with a case to protect it. When I opened the box to take the case out, I saw that it had a big scratch on it. We're really sorry about that. I can offer to have the camera repaired for you. In the event that it can't be repaired, we'll send you a replacement. Um, I don't think so. 
Seeing as it was faulty in the first place, I wouldn't want another one. I think I'd rather have my money back. Can I get a refund? Yes, of course. If you send it back to customer services, I'll make sure it's dealt with. Thank you very much. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You'll hear a tour guide talking to a group of visitors about Bestley Castle. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Besley Castle. It's nice to see so many of you here today. Before we go in, I'd like to tell you some information about the castle, the things to see and do, and the facilities available to you in the grounds. We'll do our best to make this a truly memorable visit. Now, the castle grounds are quite big, and we don't want you to get lost, so I'm going to give you an idea of the layout. At the moment, we are at the entrance, and immediately to our left is the tourist information office. Go here if you need any questions answered. They'll be happy to help. And of course, behind the tourist office is the car park where the coach dropped you off and it'll also pick you up from the same spot at 5 p.m. today. In front of us are the water gardens. If you stroll through, you get to the North Bridge, which is the entrance to Besley Castle. Take your time and enjoy looking around the castle. There's a lot of history steeped in those walls. As you leave the castle via the South Bridge, you'll be greeted with the sight of roaming deer. During the day, there will be scheduled feeding opportunities where visitors can get involved. However, we do request that you do not feed the deer outside these times. To the right of the deer park is the Castle Museum, and behind that is our award-winning restaurant. It's a relatively new addition to the castle grounds, but is fast gaining a reputation for its food. Alternatively, you can choose to dine in the picnic area on the other side of the deer park. It's perfect for the family as it's next to the kids' play area and homemade ice cream hut. We hope that on your way out, you pop into the gift shop by the exit for something to remember us by. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Admission to the grounds is free for all. That includes the museum, gardens and picnic area. There is an admission fee for the castle, which is £6.50 for adults, with a 10% discount for students and retired people. Children under the age of 16 pay half adult price and under 8 go in free. There are many spectacular events throughout the year, and for most of them, there's also an admission fee. As these events are in high demand, it's a good idea to book well in advance. Some of the exciting events planned for this year are the Summer Medieval Festival, 
where you can watch old-fashioned nights and experience a feast in the halls of the castle as if you were a guest of King Henry VIII himself. There are several concerts planned this year, too, including a rock concert at an admission price of £10 per person and a special jazz concert, which is free to the public. I'm sure you'll agree that all tastes and ages will be satisfied. One scary but extremely popular event is the annual Haunted Castle event at the end of October, where the castle comes alive at night. Why don't you come along if you're brave enough? Another sight to see is the fantastic firework display on November 5th, and the cost of that includes refreshments. We also have a long tradition of raising money for charity. The charity event held every year on the first day of May will this year be an archery contest. Entrance is free, but donations are certainly welcome. This year, we'll be collecting money on behalf of a charity for elderly people, age concern. Just in case you can't remember all of that, you can pick up a leaflet showing the timetable and prices for all events from the Tourist Information Desk. You can also go online to get this information from our website. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You'll hear three university students talking about a presentation which one of them has to give. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Joe. Hi, Isabel. Hi, Paul. Oh, hi, Paul. I've heard you've been stressing out about your presentation on art. I am. Are you still going to talk about the different types of art? Yes. Well, I was planning to, but there's so much stuff on the subject that I'm finding it difficult to put it all into one short presentation. Huh. I usually have the opposite problem. There's nothing worse than going blank, forgetting your words, in front of a group of people. Well, the problem is that I don't know how to organize what I want to say in the presentation. Well, you know everything there is to know about the subject. It's just a question of selecting what you want to talk about. Well, there's a lot to discuss about the different periods in art. That's a good way to start. Then you can bring in how specific types of art were popular in each period. Yes, like how sculpture was popular in the Classical period and paintings were popular in the Renaissance period. And how now a wide variety of media are used to create modern art. As long as you keep it concise because it's a large area, there are so many periods and movements in art, and you don't want to just list them one by one. I agree. An explanation of the movements and periods in art wouldn't be too long. You're right. I need to just pick out some key points. Just mention the periods quickly so that I can move on to the real topic of the presentation. Yes, the variety of art, like sculpture, paintings, installations. I have an idea. Why don't you prepare a timeline to show to the class? That would be a nice visual, and it would focus your ideas so you don't get too sidetracked. Great idea. It would certainly cut down on time. Right then. Where are we? 
you'll begin with a very short introduction to the historical periods of art. Then, you'll talk about popular types of art within these periods. That's sorted. Maybe you could also mention some key works of art in each period, like the Venus de Milo statue or the screen by Edvard Munch, and give some interesting facts on them. That's not a bad idea, because it does give people a frame of reference when I talk about specific kinds of art. After giving a historical context, I should really talk about different forms of art, shouldn't I? Yes, you should. After that, you can conclude with a question on what is considered to be art. Now, that would be really interesting. Yes, comparing the traditional views of art with modern views. Exactly. I think I'll have a collection of pictures, including famous pieces of art from classic to modern, projected on the wall, like the Mona Lisa and some pop art, and ask people whether they think it's art or not. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Showing some famous works and asking people what art is would certainly lead to discussion in the room. People's appreciation of art is so subjective, and it comes down to taste. That's what I'm hoping for, some disagreement to liven up the presentation. And you could stick in some really controversial ones like graffiti, and modern art installations in between pieces of art that are universally accepted, like the work of the Renaissance painters. Sounds good to me. I have to say I really don't understand some modern art myself. There was one recently that was just a pile of rubbish. It doesn't require much skill to create, does it? And what does it mean? There's no point to it. Actually, Joe, I like some modern art. It makes you look at the world in a different way. Artists now have the freedom to express themselves completely. Yes, but there is an idea now that anything can be art. I've heard of paintings being sold for large sums of money, which have been done by small children and animals. Now that's ridiculous. Oh, you could find one of those paintings and put it in your presentation, couldn't you, Paul? That would really be interesting. Well, Paul, what do you think? I like it. Just thinking. I'll need to do some more research to find pictures for the slideshow. Yes, we can help you, can't we, Joe? Of course. If you go to the fine art section of the library, I'm sure you'll find everything you need. Just ask the staff and they'll give you access to a slide bank of hundreds of famous works of art. And if you still can't find what you're looking for, Use the library computers to go online. There are lots of images on the internet. Of course, you'll need to use a search engine like Google, but it's dead easy. Thanks, guys. I'm feeling much clearer about the project. Your ideas have been really useful. I think I should end with a quote of some kind by a famous artist. What do you think? That's a good idea. Now let's go to the library and see what they have. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about languages. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, in the first lecture on anthropology, we're going to look at languages and how they are disappearing fast and what effect that's having on people and the world as a whole. We hear so much in the news about the possible extinction of animal and plant species in the world. It's a sad thing that one day certain animals will cease to exist. But how many of you are aware that the world's languages are facing a similar threat? Believe it or not, there are currently more than 6,000 languages spoken in the world today, but experts believe that by the end of this century, this number will be reduced to half. And as each language dies, the culture and specialised knowledge of a community dies with it. The unique knowledge of the environment, local wildlife, plants, animals and ecosystems, not to mention the cultural traditions of the people themselves, will become lost forever. In essence, each language is not just spoken or written words strung together. Language has the power to hold the entire history of a people. Approximately one language dies every two weeks. This is an unprecedented situation. Never before in history has there been this rate of rapid decline. Most human languages are spoken by relatively very few people. Let's put this into perspective. The Ethnologue, the leading authority on the world's languages, has put together a list of every living language known to man. There are over 6,500, of which 6,000 have available population figures. Now, 109 million people speak just 10 of these languages, and they are the major languages of the world. At the opposite end of the scale, there are minority languages which are only spoken by a few people, and that's what this chart is illustrating. The number of languages is represented on the vertical axis, and the total number of languages that make up this group is an astounding 1,619. For each of these smaller language groups, the population range of speakers goes from 1 to 999. Even more incredible is the fact that out of these small languages, over 200 of them have a speaker population ranging from just 1 to 9. Imagine only 9 people speaking your language in the whole world, or even only 1 or 2 people. Now, let's think geographically. In total, there are 516 languages that are nearly extinct, where only a few members of the older generation survive. When they die, the language will die with them, lost forever. The majority of nearly extinct languages come from the Pacific and the Americas, making up 74%, followed by Asia at 15%. Europe has the smallest percentage of languages that are nearly extinct, only 2%. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 37 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 37 to 40. Entire languages which have survived for centuries are disappearing as we speak. But why is this happening now? There are several reasons for a language's demise. Globalization has made the world smaller and technology has made it easier for people separated by vast distances to communicate in a common language which further ensures the growth in economic status for such communities. Minority languages have given way to the main languages of global communication, like English. On a social level, speakers may feel the minority language to be old-fashioned and behind the times. Maybe even speakers are slightly embarrassed to speak the language of their forefathers, identifying more with an international language that brings with it improved economic status. 
Now, some do argue that a reduction in the number of world languages is inevitable and anything to ease communication between nations is a good thing and, granted, there is a point to be made there, but what are the long-term implications of this? Consider this. Language, in both spoken and written form, is the vehicle for oral traditions to be passed down through generations. When a language becomes extinct, this link is broken and these oral traditions are lost. This has enormous implications for the identity of a community. We can't stop the changes that are happening in the world, but we can try to keep languages alive through language maintenance programs and by documenting languages before they disappear, so they can be studied and maybe even resurrected in the future. It's also important to remember that many people who speak threatened languages can neither read nor write. Helping them become literate goes a long way towards protecting the language. Preserving a language is not easy, but there have been exceptional cases where languages have been brought back to life. In Ireland, Irish Gaelic, once a dying language, through national determination is now spoken by 13% of the country's population. We'll go into what happened there in more detail in my second lecture. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.